so this talk, which I did actually in March, hence the August through March, but I haven't really learned much in the last four weeks or so, so this will be for the last uh, six weeks, I mean, so this will be close enough. <laughs> um, I did it at uh, QCon London where they had a DDD track, and that was uh, quite interesting. One of the patterns in the book is hands-on modeler. And that means that people who are involved in the modeling process for, a, uh, for some software should be involved in the development of that software. They should be hands-on to some degree. Not saying that everyone has to be a full-time programmer, <clears throat> but that they should be, they should get in there to some degree. And in my case, it means that I have to be involved in real projects <coughs> and involved hands-on sometimes. Now, people want me to talk about strategy and, you know, the big picture of their system, and that's mostly what they want from me. But I tell them that, you know, I have to also have some contact with that ground level, or else I'm not going to give good advice. Or on another level, if I don't have <coughs> an involvement in projects and an... Uh, in some hands-on experiences, I'm not going to stay sharp and stay up to date and keep learning things that I can talk about in groups <coughs> like this. So it's very important to underline that. Every effective DDD person is a hands-on modeler, including me. And so, a lot of things I'm going to talk about are not exactly different from the book, especially the things on this list, but with a little different emphasis. And one thing that I think I've learned is better how to pull out those things in a 500-page book, which parts are really, really the most essential. And I'll start with this one, which is pretty early in the book, too. Bringing about a creative collaboration of domain experts and software experts. Now, what patterns in the book would be related to that? Anybody? Somebody say ubiquitous language, please. <laughs> I'm waiting. <coughs> oh, thank you. Okay, there would be one. And quite a few of the patterns are actually about creating this creative collaboration of domain experts and software experts. But let's just focus on that one. Because we aren't content to just create an elegant model ourselves. And I'm assuming that most of the people here are the software expert side of things. Anybody here um, not a software person, like you're involved in the, more in the business side? Everybody here is a software guy. Yeah. Exploration and experimentation. So many times, and still, as I go around to all these projects and they're trying to do DDD and so on, and one of the 90% of the time, they are not experimenting enough. They'll do the process, sort of, and then they come to a point where they have a good model. They have something that's useful. They say, there, we're done. But the first useful model you encounter, what are the odds that that was the best you could have done? You know, you're, you're just, you're just, you've just gotten to the very first good idea. And so, People need to do a lot more of that. And then they get that one, and they start building, and they never look back. But next week, when you start to hit a glitch or two, do you say, OK, we can work around this, we can work around that, and you've already frozen yourself, your mind, into that shape of that original model. And so you're already working around its limitations. Instead of challenging it and saying, it doesn't handle this case very well, let's go and look at what the options are. And I mean blast it wide open, because you might discover a much better solution, or you might at least discover one that will resolve the current issue without lots of additional complication. This is an exploration process, exploring alongside our partners, the domain experts. And then 
there's this round and round thing. The language evolves, and the model evolves, and then we, you know, dive into the thick of things for a while, and things get a little confusing, and then you explore again, and then you come back to the model and the uh, ubiquitous language. You might discover that it's hard to say something. You know, this new case comes up, and your language doesn't quite capture it concisely. You end up with a big complicated explanation. Maybe a complicated explanation in carefully written kind of standard English. But you say, my ubiquitous language, I mean my... I want to be able to say these things crisply and unambiguously. Time to go back to exploring. And who do you explore with? Somebody can say them. Thank you. The domain expert. Good. You'll break down. All right. Explicit context boundaries. This is in the book. Sadly, it's in chapter 14. <laughs> Most people haven't gotten that far in. <laughs> so, yes, in chapter 14 it talks about the importance of explicit context boundaries. If I had it to do over again, that would be in chapter 2 or 3. And it is so important because just like just as a language, you know, just as a statement in a language makes no sense just floating around by itself. Models make no sense just floating around. If I just laid a UML diagram on the table and said, tell me something about this, you, you couldn't answer any useful question. You could just, you could guess, and you could, uh, you know, you, but what you'd be guessing at would be the context within which it should be. And then, but if I told you a lot about the context, then you could maybe make some statements about, ah, this could be useful for this, but would have drawbacks here. Without any context, without any notion of the application, its relationship to other modules within the system. So, if you haven't already done so, I urge you to look into context mapping. I think it is perhaps the one thing in there that I would say should be done on every project. I've never seen a project that I wouldn't have done a context map. I've seen many projects where I would not have done elaborate object modeling or any other kind. But I've never seen one that wouldn't benefit from some kind of context map. And finally, focus on the core domain. That's chapter 15, sadly. But the core domain is... Uh, is, is one of those kind of soft sounding things. Find the differentiator involved in your uh, software, right? How is your software supposed to change the situation for this business you're in? And I don't mean, well, we're going to be able to save 5% a year over the next five years by uh, doing this process incrementally more efficiently. I mean that uh, there was a whole new market that we could get into if we had this software, or we could defend our market share from that other guy who can get in. <coughs> Something significant. Okay, this is the list that I come up with. If I had to give up everything else, these would be the things I would focus on. Improving the relationship of the domain experts and the software experts, making the whole process more exploratory and experimental, which, and, and especially in regards to you know, keeping it connected with the ubiquitous language, nailing down the context boundaries, and really focusing relentlessly on the core domain. Moving on. There's a section in the book called the Building Blocks. And this is talking about the problem of, all right, I'm modeling. And in a sense, our modeling paradigm is too general. In a sense, it's just saying, well, we have objects and we have relationships between objects. And this is just too broad because <clears throat> 
What we want, I think, is something that structures that a bit more. Puts things into categories, helps you make some shortcuts, good guesses. Helps communicate the nature of your choices. So you say, that, so there's a handful of these patterns, like uh, value objects. You say, this is a value object, and someone else who knows these patterns will immediately be able to infer a lot about that. So communication is better. But also, people through experience have found that certain kinds of, you know, characteristics of objects make them more useful, or certain kinds of relationships tend to be good solutions to certain problems. And so you leverage that. And the consistency improves of your modeling, and you... Uh, and you're better able to communicate about it and collaborate with people. And this is all uh, well and good. Uh, it's, I think, a pretty important thing when you're trying to get down to that nitty-gritty level of making uh, software that really reflects the conceptual model, which is part of what we mean by the ubiquitous language, right? that it goes all the way down. If I talk with a domain expert, I use the same language as I would if I talked to another software person, and even if I talk to the computer, so to speak, in terms of a computer of programming language. These kind of patterns help you to uh, make that part work well. So what have I learned about the building blocks? Well, the first thing I think is that they are overemphasized. Although I do think they're important, people get very focused on them. This is one reason no one makes it to chapter 14, because they all get stuck in chapter 5. Uh, <laughs> which is where the building blocks really get going. And so they're overemphasized. But heck, let's add another one. <laughs> because the set wasn't quite complete. <clears throat> May still not be complete. You know, I don't pretend that this is a... a the final <coughs> word on anything. And one particular one has emerged over the last few years as being really an important ingredient. When I was writing the book, there were these things, and they made me uncomfortable, uh, where you kind of wanted it to be an entity, for those of you who aren't that familiar with it, don't worry about this part because they're overemphasized anyway. <laughs> and uh, maybe you want it to be an entity, but you kind of wanted some of the characteristics of a value object, immutability perhaps. And neither one really seemed to capture. And so what has come along, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, there was a nibbling of this even before the book, but what's really become clear to me in the last few years is we need another category, another building block, and we just call those domain events. So here's a picture. And the thing that I'm focusing on here is this, the scoreboard. There's stuff happening here. This is the domain. The domain is the a baseball game. <clears throat> but cert and not everything, like let's say that this is recording that there was a, um, that someone had a ball on it or they had four balls they walked. In other words, they go to first base. So you could, you could record that the person took a step, and then they took another step, and then they took another step, and then they took another step, and another, and another, and another, and another, and then they got to first base. But no one is interested in that, right? A domain event, like anything in a model, zeroes in on something important to the domain expert. The domain expert cares that someone reached first base. They care that there was, uh, that there were four balls or whatever, or maybe there was a strike or three strikes and this guy's out. And so, but you know, along the way to the strikes, well, you know, the guy swayed back and forth and he raised his bat up, and all of these are events. In fact, in our systems. In order to make them work, there's all kinds of little events firing this way and that way. That's not quite what we're talking about here. Right? We're talking about that level of event that you want to record because something important that happened in the domain. 
And they have a kind of consistent form, too. Like, they tend to happen at a certain time. They tend to have some person associated with them. Maybe the person who recorded it, maybe the person who did it, maybe both. Maybe a time that it happened and a time it was recorded. There, uh, and they are also uh, typically immutable. You record that this happened and that's it. You record that this guy struck out and that's it. You don't go back and... Uh, well, you could go back and change it if it turned out that it was an error, that you entered something incorrectly. But you don't go back because, oh, let's just, you know, I don't know, you just don't. <laughs> so, with domain events, we get clearer, more expressive models, but we also get some very interesting architectural options. And this is another thing that I think has become more important over the last few years, because Finally, after a long wait, after expecting it for a long time, distributed systems really are happening. <laughs> now that's really an important thing that many of us have to deal with. And uh, domain events are really valuable for that. So, because uh, they... Uh, okay, so let's imagine a kind of an extreme approach or we say that you don't just modify the state of objects. You, you uh, have events, right? An event happens, and as a result, that state is different. So let's suppose that, you know, looking back at our scoreboard, and uh, the bottom line is this, uh, this uh, score. And the old school way would be that, you know, basically each team, I guess, is an entity and their score is a value that they would have. And it goes up, and if someone gets a point, that's really all that can You change the two to a three, three runs. But in this world, we're saying, well, maybe the run is an event. So uh, the, the run is recorded. And uh, then... If you want to know the score of this team, you look at the runs, right? Where do, what events have happened? And <clears throat> this might be useful, imagine, in a distributed system where maybe the equivalent of runs are being reported from different places. Now, you can't have a 100% consistent view in a distributed system at all times. But... You can, uh, but you can uh, deal with that if you've got a very well-defined event model. So runs are coming in, and you report the score according to the runs that you've heard about. Now, maybe a run happened since, you know, that hasn't yet reached you. Maybe you've gone off to the concession stand, and someone asks you what the score is, and you tell them, but there was actually a run that happened since you got to the concession stand, and then when you get back, you see, oh, I see that I'm out of date. Or someone says to you, no, that's wrong. You, you know, there was a run since you left. Okay, now I update my score. And I... This is, is really vital if, you know, in, in these kind of distributed systems to have some approach like this. Because if you are trying to maintain a consistent view of this entity across a distributed system, you, it, it can be extremely complex, but with the, or it can be fairly simple if you, if you have a more event-oriented view. Representing the state of entities, decoupling subsystems with event streams. Now, here I mean design decoupling. I'm not talking about the runtime, the decoupling of runtime that this allows. That is, you know, you've actually got these things running over here, these things running over here, this thing running over here, and events are going back and forth, and nothing is in a completely consistent state, but it is, uh, you know, well characterized. This is the more conventional uh, argument that, all right, we have a system here, let's say, that is uh, managing trades. Trades are happening, and that's a big job. And over here we have a system that is kind of analyzing 
doing metrics, maybe writing reports for people so they can know what's going on here. Now, one of the basic problems that teams have is that they will wire their reporting and analysis and all that, and they just wire it right in to that transactional system. They'll query the database, and, uh, and, and the result of that is that uh, now the transactional system can't be changed without changing a whole bunch of reports. Or maybe the needs of reporting will constrain the designs they can choose. And, and, all, and this is extremely tight coupling. And yet it isn't really needed because uh, the, the actual needs of the reporting uh, don't, don't call for any particular functionality in that, uh, of that sort. They just needed that data. Well, what I've seen more and more often and, and I'm convinced it's just a, a really nice solution to this sort of problem and, and other kind of similar problems, is to say, okay, you have your core transactional system or whatever, some place that you want to encapsulate. Uh, and stuff is going on here. And you just constantly send out a stream of events, domain events, that are describing the important things that have happened inside your module. Now, over here... The analytical people, the reporting people, all them, they can subscribe to your events. They can filter the ones they're not interested in. They can take the ones they are, reorganize them in any way they want, and put it into their own database, denormalize, put it into a data cube if that's what they like. And if you change your internal system, well, fine, the only thing you're really committed to from their point of view is you're committed to maintaining that stream of events. So if you want to change your definition of something that's in the event stream, you'll have to coordinate with them, much the way you would have had to do if you wanted to change your own database. But now, <clears throat> that's the only thing you actually have to coordinate on. This kind of decoupling, not just between you and that one reporting database or system, but between you and any other system that might be... Uh, doing things in response to the things you're doing. I don't know, maybe a clearing system. So over here you're doing the trades and over here you're doing the clearing. Well, the clearing system could receive a stream of, report, of uh, events from the tra trading system and use those to base that on. And then those two systems can evolve independently of each other. Don't, rem don't forget, not only does the transactional system get all bound up because it's tied too closely to the reporting system, Reports are highly constrained, too, because they have to live within the uh, existing transactional system. We might have a model that is just really good for managing matching orders and, and uh, executing trades. But maybe it's not very good at all for reporting. And if we link these two things together, w or, or uh, we, if we link these two things together, we end up with kind of a compromise that's not all that good for either one, hopefully good enough. Instead, by this level of decoupling, we can have a model that's very good for uh, trading and a model that's very good for analytical or analysis of those trades or reporting what happened. And now come back to that context map thing that I mentioned in my first list of essentials. The context map is the thing that helps you keep track of the different models you're using, make sure they don't get all mushed together into a mess, help you uh, just make that effective. Multiple models existing on the same project in a very effective way. So these things sort of start to weave together. See, the context map is so fundamental. This allows you to, you know, decouple two systems so that you could potentially use two different models there. You don't have to. Can still be a useful, can still be a very useful technique, even if you are using the same model, let's say for trading and for clearing. But if you really want two different models, then it's a great way to communicate between these two contexts. Okay, there's one more about these domain events, which I think is really important. And that is, there are some extremely high-performance systems out there. And in the past, and certainly when I wrote the book, 
I would have said, I think that that is outside the scope of DDD. I think that when you have to handle truly high transaction volumes, uh, or uh, that you are probably, you just, with current technology anyhow, you just can't keep up with it with the overhead of an object-oriented system or elaborate models. Or, that's a luxury that you may have to forego. But I don't say that anymore because there's this guy, Greg Young, who, uh, uh, who has presented at a few conferences, uh, who uh, built this system. It was oddly enough a trading system. I guess in the, 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 that that's where a lot of the DDD action happens is in the financial industries. And he had to handle tens of thousands of transactions per second. And he didn't give up, though, on objects. In fact, he wrote this thing in C -sharp, with C-sharp objects. And uh, mostly pretty standard .NET frameworks. But what he did was he, he went to a kind of radical extreme of this style of representing domain events, or really any kind of change to anything as a distinct object. So. Anything that changed, he would just say, well, there's a new object. And his, even his entities didn't actually ever change. They, they had collections of, of, of these little events. So every time you, you know, would... So to take my tired old example of the trading system, but you have your order book and you've, say, got an order, and somewhere over here we actually have a partial fill so that order is now reduced. But he wouldn't change in the order, say the order was 10,000 shares and now you've executed 5,000. He wouldn't change that to 5,000 remaining. He would just take the uh, execution, 5,000 share execution, and he would just put it in that collection. Now you can compute that 10,000 minus 5,000. And it turns out that this, <laughs> this and a few tricks uh, that he can explain far better than I can, has just a, an amazing effect on your scalability. And uh, he, he said that he mostly, as I said, used off-the-shelf.net. He had to write a custom message queue. The ones that they had were too slow for his need. And so he did that, but other than that, it was pretty standard. Now, I'm not going to try to explain exactly what he did because there, uh, I'm not very good at explaining it, first of all, and secondly, we don't have time. But I just want people to be aware of it. And who knows, maybe you're working on something along those lines, and then you can look that up. Okay. Still in the subject of the building blocks, but not those... Uh, this is the most abstract of them, the aggregates. I think this is... It's super important, the aggregates. It's perhaps the one building block that isn't overemphasized. You don't hear a whole lot of talk about it, except for one question, which is, how do you access the things inside the aggregate? It's the one question everybody asks all the time. And I've almost lost interest in that question, because I think it's not actually what's important about aggregates. It is one of those things that helps you to enforce the real rules. What are the rules of an aggregate? Well, you might... So, what is an aggregate, first of all, for those who are not up to speed? An aggregate is kind of like these grapes, in the sense that you have a, a, something you think of as a conceptual whole, which is also made up of smaller parts, and that you want to, you have rules that apply to the whole thing. So every one of those little grapes is part of this grape bunch. In fact, in French, the word that the cognate of grape actually isn't really a cognate, it really represents this. So it's one of those funny kind of examples of a word that's almost like the other one, in just the way that would be most confusing. Now, the classic, whoops, the classic uh, example of an aggregate might be a purchase order, where the purchase order as a whole might have properties like, well, let's say the purchase order has a limit. We've approved 
$5,000 for this pur purchase order. And then there's an amount uh, that it has in it. Well, we've got line items in this purchase order that add up to $3,000. And all is well and good, and in a traditional OO system, this is actually one of those common examples, and they'd say, well, you add up all the things, and the purchase order object uh, compares that maybe with the limit and decides whether this purchase order is valid. But what if you have, like, say, thousands of line items in a purchase order? This is one of those places where classic OO kind of stubs its toe a little, I think. Do you want to bring in thousands of objects in order to add up one field and then compare it to another number. Because that's kind of what the OR mapper whole approach leads you to. And uh, there are many cases where I've seen this. Basically, this sort of thing is part of what torpedoes uh, sincere attempts to do DDD. Because they run into a few of these things and they start to think, well, this just isn't practical. Or they say, well, we'll keep doing that modeling stuff, but meanwhile we have to do this other thing. So they'll have a query, a simple sum in their SQL database will do the job, and they'll put it in the service probably. And you know, So all of a sudden what you've got is you've got anemic objects. Anemic objects meaning they don't really do anything. They carry some data around. They're basically fancy data structures. And all the action is happening in some place else, maybe the services. Well, so the aggregates is saying, you know, there are things bigger than an object that have a cohesive wholeness to them. And those things we want to, uh, they have their own properties and they have their own rules. So in this case, purchase order as a whole has a, you know, an amount that's ordered, the ordered amount. Now, you can say what it, how do you define it? Because it's the sum of the amount of every line item. That's the definition. If I think of a model more abstractly, as opposed to the object model where I have to say this, this root purchase order object, the root of this aggregate, owns these other objects and is responsible for collecting together all their individual um, amounts. If I don't quite go that, I think that's over-specifying the problem, or the, the model. What you're saying is, in fact, that there is a property of this whole collection, and that property is the sum of the amounts. If I stop there, I leave the door open to different ways of finding the answer to that question, what is the sum of all these amounts? It really may be that I need to do a SQL sum, but I can put it in a more natural place. Maybe uh, in the book even I mentioned the possibility of having repository queries like count and sum, but some people I've seen have experimented with having an object that actually represents the aggregate itself. But they give it a few extra privileges. They'll do queries from that object. And I don't know. I honestly don't have a strong opinion about how to implement these things. But I do have a strong opinion that you need to loosen up a little bit when you get to this. Because I think it is a weak point in the OO paradigm. That OO is really good at handling these little interactions of objects, of individual objects. And it's not so good at handling collections of objects, big collections. Now, the, of course, relational databases are, are potentially really good at that kind of thing. But um, what, we, what we need to do then is think a little more abstractly. So what do we do? OK, then when you start to think about an aggregate in the abstract, you're looking at uh, basically, this boundary within which we, we, we see it as a conceptual whole, and we want it to be consistent. Remember I was talking about in a distributed system, not everything is going to be consistent all the time. But 
we need some boundary where we know that it's consistent. So let's suppose that uh, we said that, well, you know, purchase order is one of these. And we are going to have that as a consistency boundary. That means that we want to be consistent in terms of transactions. Well, let's just stop there for a minute. Transactions. That would mean, for example, that if we had a transaction like uh, release the trans the release this purchase order, so that uh, part of that would be to check that the purchase order wasn't over its limit. You can't release a purchase order if its total amount is more than its limit. So we add up all the line items. We discover that they are twelve thousand dollars, but the limit was ten thousand dollars. So the, res the end result of that transaction is uh, maybe an error or some kind of a, you know, uh, notification or something, but not the release of the purchase order. You need, in a thing like that, you need to have consistency. You need to be able to say, I've looked at all the line items. Um, now, there would be other ways to do it. If you distributed the pieces of a purchase order all over the place, then I'm sure there's a way to figure out if the purchase order is ready to be released. But uh, it sounds terribly complicated. If you have the ability to do it entirely within one transaction, it's simple. So you, you're looking for these kind of pieces that are not so big, but not a single object either. And then you use those consistency boundaries and you say, at the end of every transaction, all the rules of that aggregate are followed. However, that's not true if in regards to other aggregates. So let's say that we had a general departmental guideline that we couldn't spend more than you know, $30,000 a month on this. And so this, this purchase order is $10,000. This one is 10,000. You know, we've got multiple purchase orders now. And we've got this guideline that says we're not going to go over. Well, if we've defined our, our uh, aggregate as being that purchase order, each of those purchase orders has to be completely consistent at the time of its, uh, at, at its transaction commit. But it doesn't mean that it has to be consistent with all the others. So that doesn't mean that when we commit, we have checked to see if we've pushed the whole department over its limit. That's got to be handled at some higher level. And then whatever response to that I might... Uh, you know, of course, I'm not saying that this is the way to run a department necessarily. I'm just saying that that's what it would mean. That it would be that we would allow short-term deviations from the rules uh, if, if they were beyond the level of an aggregate. If you want a distributed system, you, you just have to have stuff like that. But distribution and concurrency both, the trouble that you run into there is that you need to um, have some unit that, um, that you need to define what has to be consistent at the end of every transaction and what doesn't have to be. And the aggregate pattern tries to relate this back to some kind of conceptual whole. So it's saying, don't just, every time you encounter a new, oh, you know, we've been having problems with that transaction. Well, let's see, I see we need to do this check before it's committed. And, this, and then over there you say, oh, when we distributed this, uh, okay, we need to pull this thing with it too. And every one of these decisions ad hoc and separate so that you've got a, 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 a situation no human being can understand. And if you can't understand it, you can't change it. So, instead of that, keep pulling back to the model. You say, oh, we've got this transactional problem. Why? What's the rule that isn't that we discovered we need to enforce? And how can we incorporate it into our conceptual model? How can we make it make sense? <laughs> as opposed to just being a rule, one of hundreds. If we discover that we need that other thing to be on the same node of the network in order for things to work well in a distributed system, 
Well, that's not the end of the story. The next question is why? What is it about that that's so tightly associated with this, that we really need them together? Is this, should that thing be in the aggregate? But that would mean that the transactional rules also apply at all times. Or is it, uh, they can also go the other way. Um, we've got this big clunky thing, and uh, we discover that uh, there are, that, that we're causing, um, that we're causing locking problems, that we're causing uh, that uh, because we basically are trying to enforce too many rules at once, that the various transactions that are happening keep getting blocked by other ones. So we say, well, maybe our concept that this is essentially uh, one thing is just, maybe that's not a useful model. It's a model, right? Maybe the entire Maybe it's not right to have an entire purchase order be one aggregate. Maybe we should have had different elements within it. So, use that aggregate concept. Um, I already talked about this, that, you know, an aggregate should be a conceptual whole and it has properties, it has invariant rules. Uh-oh. All right, moving along. What have I learned? Now, we talked mostly, that's enough about building blocks. So, now on to strategic design, which is like the last third of the book. As I mentioned, context mapping is one of the principles of strategic design. Distillation of the core domain is one of them and large-scale structure was the third. There were three principles of, of strategic design that are presented in that last section. And I'll talk first about large-scale structure. What have I learned about that? I learned one important thing. It just doesn't come up that often. So if you're going to skip a chapter, skip that chapter. And luckily, it's way back at the back of the book, so probably already haven't read it anyway. Oh, I find that stuff interesting, and sometimes it's been useful to me in the past, but, you know, you've got to set priorities, and this one just isn't, doesn't come up all that often, so let's move along. The other ones I've already talked about, right, distillation and, distil and uh, context mapping, I already said how important I thought those were. Okay, here's another thing, setting the stage. What does it take to set the stage for a successful DDD project? Well, one where you're going to do some cool modeling and build a system that maybe couldn't have been developed another way, or, or could have been by some army of thousands of developers, but then it couldn't be, you know, agilely changed all the time. What would it take? Well, one thing is, I kind of alluded to at the very first slide when I said, why model? You really need to know why. And that means not spreading it too thin. Because if you look at systems, you'll find, most of them anyway, that the bulk of the system is pretty straightforward stuff. Maybe there's lots of crud, lots of just data that has to be collected and maybe reported on or maybe... Um, the ability to view it and just keep it as reference information. But the place where modeling pays off the most is in those intricate little problems <clears throat> where there's a lot of business logic and kind of confusing cases. And uh, if you can focus down, find a way to not spend much time on those big simple, th big, you know, they may be complicated in the sense of just how huge they are, but they are not intricate. Focus down on those intricate parts. Then another uh, way of reducing the amount of modeling you do is find out what that core domain is. Not just the intricate parts, but the intricate parts that are in the core domain. The other ones, well, let the army attack them. But you're 
you know, what you want for a, a DDD project that's really going to be valuable and everyone's going to walk away and say, wow, that was, that was cool and that was really valuable. That is going to be in the core domain. and There's going to be some kind of intricacy there or at least a need for extreme clarity. I find sometimes the problem isn't even all that complicated, but it's one where clarity, where there's a value to just making it incredibly clear. The clarity is just so sharp. You know, you, you look at uh, some of the Apple products and people say, wow, they're, they're so nice. Well, what makes them so nice? I think if you look at the iPod, for example, it must have had fewer features than any of the other MP3 players and by far the most popular, the nicest one. Why? Partly because it had fewer features than any of the other MP3 players. They were utterly focused. What is it people want with their MP3 player? They figured out exactly the most important things, and that's what they gave them. And they made sure those parts were just crystal clear, and the rest was just gone. Or at least it was out of the way. Now, I'm not saying that... Uh, I wouldn't have liked a feature or two that they didn't put in. <laughs> I'm saying, though, that if you want to, you know, build great, do modeling. Modeling is kind of an intensive activity. If it's spread too thin, it just recreates a mediocre result that isn't really distinguishable from other ways of doing it, except that you tend to take on heavier infrastructure, like all those OR mappers and things. And what do you need to know our mapper for if the objects you're creating are no more useful than the database tables were in the first place? So, focus down. Then the next thing you need is a clean bounded context. I don't know how many times I've already mentioned how important these context boundaries are, but it's not enough times because it, you've really got to have... And so bounded context is the thing I said you know, that, that context map that tells you where your contexts are and has boundaries around them. That's something I think almost any project could benefit from. I'm adding the word clean here because I'm saying to do DDD very effectively, you need to be able to carve out this space. And within this space, things are clean. You don't have all that chaos of the, you know, the, the cowboy coder running around making a mess. You don't have... Uh, 50 people who don't quite understand what each other is doing. You, you have a focused, uh, well-coordinated team within a clearly defined boundary. And you need an iterative process. Uh, because to create a great model, you need the chance to experiment. And, then, and the experiment part extends to having that software get used a little bit. And then you really learn. And then you fold that learning back into a <clears throat> new model. And I'll just say it because you can never say this one too many times. You must have access to a domain expert. It's a funny thing. In the last few years, since I wrote that book where I wrote in the preface, there are two prerequisites to DDD. And they are an iterative process of some kind and access to domain experts. And I very often get asked, so we've kind of got a waterfall process dictated to us. How would you suggest we apply DDD? <laughs> or even more common is, well, we just don't really have good access to domain experts, but we want to do DDD anyway, so <coughs> we want you to help us figure that out. And um, it's surprising how hard it is to get across sometimes that what I mean is that you must have these things. <laughs> you just have to have them. And if you don't, you can't do DDD. Just can't. I mean, you can go through all the motion. You could do all the work. Of course, you can apply the process, but you won't get any good out of it. You won't get a good result. So don't waste your effort. Go back to another more conventional approach. Uh, but... If you've got these ingredients, you can do wonderful things. But if you don't have them, it's, the process just won't work. It's like, you know, you could 
If you don't have any gasoline, you can buy a car anyway, but what's the point? You've just wasted thousands of dollars and now your driveway is full. So don't do it. Okay. Um, I'm going to start uh, going a little faster. Context mapping, this thing I keep bringing up. But I've learned a few things about this too. And one of the things is, uh, well, okay, I already told you that defining context. So, um, one of the things <clears throat> that I have learned about context mapping is that, uh, well, so there, okay, for those who aren't that familiar though with context mapping, uh, there was several patterns about the nature of these different contexts and also the way they relate to each other. Things like maybe this one is upstream of that one. And uh, so as a result, you know, this guy is kind of on his own and he has to build a sort of defensive software structure we call the anti-corruption layer to keep what those people are doing from messing them up. Or maybe you need to integrate with someone and they don't really care if you integrate with them. So it's all on you. Versus other situations where there might be more of a cooperation. And I realized as we were actually trying to draw the context maps of many different projects that there are a few patterns that were missing. So one of those is this thing I'm calling partners. And that is where you have two teams that are mutually dependent. This does not mean dependency in the technical sense. It means dependency in the sense of can I deliver my project successfully? if he doesn't deliver his project successfully? And of course, in many cases, the answer is no. Because if maybe, uh, maybe in a technical sense, he's completely dependent on you, but in an actual project sense, yeah, okay, you could run your software without him, but no one would want it. No one wants it because they need both pieces to make it a useful system. Whatever the reason, in these cases, you usually have a cooperative kind of relationship because people are forced to be cooperative. Not because they like to be cooperative, because they're forced to. So that's why I chose this picture. This is a three-legged race. Uh, anybody ever participate in a three-legged race? Yeah? So, two people's one leg is tied together and they have to ran, run a race. And so the thing about this is that being the fastest runner is really not the key to winning a three-legged race. In fact, if you have a very fast runner tied to a very slow runner, it may actually be a disadvantage. But what's most important is that they manage to sync up very well. So they run at exactly the same pace, exactly in sync with each other. And that's really who wins the three-legged race. These people, uh, I think, are winning, and those people must be pretty well synced. These people are out of the race. They, one of them went too fast, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, the point is that to win, you have to be cooperative, not because you want to be, because you want to win. Okay, here's another missing ingredient. I just, one day, I suddenly had a light come on, and I said, half at least of the, of the context that we're putting up here on the board are made up of a big mess that there is really no reason for us to be worrying about picking apart. In fact, it fits a pattern which was written up. It's a wonderful pattern that you should look up. So I put the URL there of the original version. And, or if you just Google for a big ball of mud, you'll find it. And uh, these guys observed <laughs> that there was very little written about what, as they put it, was arguably the most successful architecture <laughs> ever applied. And that's what they call the big ball of mud, where people just do stuff. People just, you know, when they need a change, they just stick it in there somewhere. They just connect these two things if it's handy to do so and worry about the consequences later, or just don't worry about it. And so on and so on. It just builds up and it builds up. And yet functions. And they said, well, you know, we go on and on and on about all these elegant architectures that we like so much, 
The truth is, when you look at most software that's actually out there running, doing useful things, it usually looks like this. And so uh, I thought, wow, that's brilliant. And not only that, but you see it all the time. And people, and people get kneecapped by it, too, because they'll feel like um, if they're going to do DDD, they have to fix this. This uh, doesn't look like anything that was in my book. And so how do you do that? And uh, the truth is, well, I don't know how you do that. I don't think you can do that. You know? So what do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you draw a context map. Sometime we'll tally up how many times I say that in one talk. <clears throat> so, And you draw a big circle around this big ball of mud, and you say, this is a big ball of mud, and here is a, a boundary around it. You've got to define that boundary in some terms of something real. How do I know where the big ball of mud will sprawl and where it won't? Big balls of mud tend to sprawl. They tend to reach out their tentacles. Anything nearby will get sucked into the big ball of mud. <laughs> That's its nature. And so maybe sometimes you kind of build a little wall around yourself. And you say, well, I'm just going to keep the ball of mud out of here. And maybe not forever either, just long enough for us to build this one extremely valuable, intricate thing. The big ball of mud, the funny thing is the big ball of mud is not destructive. As the big ball of mud oozes out, features never go away. They never get rid of anything, in fact. So if you can build your thing in an enclosure, let's say, that keeps the mud out for, let's just say, one year, one year of paradise within your little walls, and you have built this intricate and extremely valuable thing. And then, as it inevitably will, the wall will break down and the mud will come oozing in. It will not make your system stop working. No matter how intricate your system was, it will continue to do the same things it did before. It's just that no one will be able to understand it anymore, and no one will be able to change it anymore. But you had a year, and you got something valuable built that you couldn't have done if you just admitted that there was going to be a big ball of mud and tried to build it in the ball of mud. So, okay. That's the ball of mud actually has all these old ancient civilizations with contexts in it. Yes, in fact, I'll bet if you could, you know, an archaeology of a big ball of mud would probably be a fascinating thing. I'll bet that again and again and again, people created kind of temporary, they probably didn't think of them as temporary, but they built highly organized systems there. And then eventually the ball of mud enclosed them. And it will enclose yours too. But, but that doesn't mean those things weren't valuable. <laughs> it doesn't mean it wasn't valuable. Right? You had that year. And that year, w you could do in that year what it might take 10 years to do in the ball of mud directly. Or it just couldn't be done. And also it would be fun, which I think is an important value also. Of course, a moat or a wall is uh, two metaphors for that obstacle, the boundary. And that boundary has to take some form. You know. It, so I've actually seen cases where the adoption of a new technology, and usually I say, oh, phew, new technology, you're just distracting yourself. I've actually seen cases where someone will, they'll say, well, we should do Java. And what I see is that for a couple of years, they actually get good results in Java, but not because there's anything better about Java than there was about the old technology. It's because it's an effective boundary. The old ball of mud, which was, say, you know, written in COBOL, of course. <laughs> uh, the, and, uh, but it can't ooze directly. It can ooze indirectly. And once it starts to ooze, it becomes a flood. It, it oozes indirectly because you have to integrate. And so all those nicely, carefully crafted bridges that you've created between you and the old COBOL system, but eventually they get overwhelmed. But for a while, it, it really can work. <laughs>
But I'm not really going to propose that people adopt a new technology every two years just to keep the big ball of mud out. But it's interesting what can create an effective barrier. That's an, another thing that I think there's more to be learned. And it's observational stuff. You can look at your own project and see, was there a project that somehow got a little space? Sometimes I think that the best defense of your little enclave from the big ball of mud is just a, a ferocious project manager. I've seen those cases. Eventually people do leave your, ball, your little context alone because they're just afraid to tangle with that guy. And that can work. That could be an entire job. You know, like you could be the defender of your, uh, your context. I think that I have much more in the last few years emphasized the importance of strategy. Maybe coming from a small talk background gave me a certain bottom-up bias that I um, still gravitate to, but I think that unless you've carved out that context map, I mean, unless you've carved out that clean context, all that fine elegant modeling and design is for nothing because it will get sucked into the ball of mud faster than you can make it. On the same time, uh, if you are working on some problem that is secondary and not directly related to the core domain, you may well succeed in delivering and everyone will yawn. Or they'll pat you on the back and say, nice job. And that's all because Nobody really cared very much. But when you are working in the core domain and you manage to carve out that context and you do something incredible in that, you know, you're the hero. They will remember. And so, oh, okay, I just want to talk about this a little. DDD and SOA. There's like a whole category of things I could do in this, and that is something and DDD. MDA and DDD, what's the difference? <laughs> or why should I use DDD instead of SOA? Uh, I used to get that question a lot. Okay, what, why would you use DDD instead of SOA? Well, you wouldn't. You wouldn't use it instead of SOA. The thing is that people forget how fundamental this modeling stuff is. Modeling is just a system of abstractions. Now, what do you think a service definition is? I mean, what is it defined in terms of? Some kind of concepts, a system perhaps of concepts, concepts, abstractions. In other words, services are based on systems of abstraction. And in order to have a good service, not now there are lots of services that I must say, frankly, the definition of them is you pass in this sequence of strings and ints, and you get out this sequence of strings and ints. That's the definition. Okay, but that's not really the vision, I think, that the SOA people had at the beginning. <laughs> they had something much more conceptually coherent in mind, that these services would mean something, and meaning demands context. And so a service interface has to be defined in some context, in the same context I was talking about. Contexts aren't just for the objects or whatever. In fact, they apply to COBOL programs and they apply to service-oriented architectures. And then the internals. Now, often you'll find that the inside of a service is radically different in its concepts than the published interface. But the actual implementation is based on a whole different worldview. That may even be the big value of the service. There are services whose real value is it just sort of takes some messy thing, let's say some functions of the ball of mud, and it uh, sort of rephrases them into this elegant model and offers them up as this clear, well-defined <coughs> service. Have you encountered that, anybody? Where you have a service that doesn't actually have a lot of logic of its own. Its great value comes in allowing easier access to the functions that are in the legacy system but that are too hard to get to. Another thing is that uh, that sometimes that service interface defines a context boundary for you. Remember I was saying look for the things that can mark them off. 
Maybe you don't have to go to a whole new technology platform to escape the big ball of mud. Maybe you can use some kind of, you can say, well, I'm implementing this service and everything in here is mine. People tend to sometimes listen to that. Well, anyway, my point here is not to go into all this nitty-gritty about it. The point is to say <laughs> this question, just, you know, that question I mentioned, why should you use DDD instead of SOA? It doesn't even, it, it doesn't make sense. DDD helps you make better SOA, do better SOA.